Jennifer King. Who'd you expect? Someone white? White. An elder once told me, young blood, if you wake up after the sunrise, then you're already two hours late. I'll never forget that elder or the ill-fitting yellow leisure suit he wore that day. But I tell you all of that so you understand all of this. It's time. Time to get black, y'all. to my yappers across the world. Oh, sorry, when I say yappers, I'm not talking about my cousins who told in the 80s. Can't believe y'all told. No, I'm speaking of the countless numbers of the Your Attention Please fam that have supported us on this journey of epic blackness the last two seasons. And now we find ourselves already setting off season three. I can't take all the credit, but... So at this point, you're clearly asking yourselves, Brother Craig Robinson, just where in the hell are you broadcasting from? Fair question with a highly logical answer. But I can show you better than I can tell you. <laughs> so it turns out inside that box of history was actually a portal leading to an epic location, an intermountain layer of black power. <gasps> AKA the Fortress of Blackness. So after being overcome by what my eyes were feasting on, I decided to leave the cabin behind and go even deeper into isolation for reasons I think we are all aware of. So next thing I know, I'm navigating the final leg of what has been a truly mind melding journey into interstellar happenings. But don't worry, once I get settled into my new mountain crib, I've got more epic stories to introduce to y'all. I'll be right black. Okay. Okay. Okay, now this is nice. Not at all what I expected. Craigie can work with this. Let's set up this first segment, shall we? Wait, did y'all peep that? I didn't need a reminder. I did it all by myself. I successfully remembered to set up the first segment without any creature or robot or human off camera reminding me. It's called for a celebration and a wardrobe change. <laughs> oh, I knew those barks sounded familiar. I'd recognize them anywhere. They're my two dogs, Winsty and Tachi. <sighs> How'd y'all beat me here? We took that earlier flight, remember? Thought we'd get settled in before things got weird and crazy around here. Yeah, before things get weird and crazy. So you're, uh, pretty proud you remembered to set up the first segment, huh? Feeling pretty good about yourself and everything? Yeah, you know, can't say I'm mad about it. Probably worth a couple of pats on the back. Right, right, you're a good kid. But you do realize you're actively forgetting to do it as we speak? Yeah, as we speak. <sighs> Y'all all right, I'm gonna do better. From the mouths of pups. That's why I keep them around. Thanks, fellas. I'll take it from here. We got your back, Pops. Yeah, you know we got your back, Pops. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? The year was 2000. The place, the Bahamas. The question, who let the dogs out? Well, I spent the past 21 years trying to answer that question, and let me tell you, the answer is complex, nuanced, and we just don't have enough show to answer it. But I do know this much about those damn dogs that were let out against the wishes of those Baha men. We as humans don't deserve their loyal and loving souls. They're trustworthy, honest, 
It help us keep life in perspective. I'm talking about dogs, not the Baja men, by the way. And when it comes to dogs, no one is as committed to making sure those pooches' looks match their souls. As a master dog groomer, she not only makes pets feel special, she makes them look like works of art. Without further delay, let's bark right in. Your attention, please. Meet Ashley Ann. Let me tell you all about a little girl named Ashley Ann. I hope you all are ready for me. I was a hustler from day one. I'll sell my lunch, then I'll get the lunch money and buy cookies until I got busted. And the teachers would call my parents asking why weren't they sending me to school with lunch? My first job was in a sneaker store and after about five minutes, I knew I didn't really like working with people. So I quit. I said I would much rather work with animals. My mom knew someone at a grooming salon, so boop, I got my wish. My first big dog was a St. Bernard, Nicholas. Oh my God, I loved him so much. He was the biggest teddy bear that I've ever met. And he used to come in with just raggedy looking feet. I wasn't supposed to touch the grooming scissors, but I couldn't stand the way his feet looked. I gave him a little trim, trim, trim here and there. And right then, it clicked. I knew. I went to grooming school and I just fell in love even more. Dogs were coming so upset, like they knew when they didn't look good. Being able to really transform a dog, that means something. I realized with dogs, it was meant to be. I've always been skeptical about starting businesses. I'll be honest, sometimes people, they just talk too much. But everyone said, Ashley, my dog is always so happy to see you. You have a gift. They started giving me nicknames, Mama Ashley, TT Ashley, people's girlfriend. And then I got an email. I always say that's how God likes talking to me. He said, I have a salon for you, Ashley a new commercial space. Now, you might be asking yourself, how could a 23-year-old woman afford a commercial real estate? Well, I'll tell you. That had a 401k, a savings account, plus some cash on the side. But the salon, oh my God, the salon was horrible. And that showed me how much my clients loved me because they still showed up. I remember my first client as a business owner. I called her up and I said, I got the keys. Bring Zoe over. Zoe was an alpha female, but she let me make her look pretty. My business was born and my baby was born at the same time. This was my happy chaos. I was really getting it all done. I had one mission and that was to open this salon. I started getting a lot of word of mouth. People started coming from all over. I mean, the mayor, some of New Jersey Real Housewives, even some famous football players. Now, this job isn't all glamour. This morning, a dog literally peed on me. I have clients that text me at 2 a.m. Ash, Rocco got skunked, what do I do? And I'm just like, I am sleeping. Why is Rocco outside at 2 a.m. in the first place? Is he sneaking out the house? But let's bring it back real quick. I was building my business, getting new clients left and right. Because it wasn't just about grooming. I was transforming these dogs and they knew it. Your dog will leave my salon with a whole new attitude. I was an artist and I wanted to take what I was doing even further, figure out who the master groomers were. First step, China. Let me tell you all about Asian fusion grooming. It is a form of art if I use passion and quality. It's not just about putting a bandana on a dog and calling it a day. And you know the creator of all of this? Mavis How. She decided to take me in. And then to South Korea to learn from Suki Lee. I trained for two years and I was the first African American to graduate from Do All Grooming Academy. And I've been changing the game ever since. I decided to bring my talents back to the States and spoil my clients. My first one up, Daphne. Her mom had a gender reveal, a boy. Later that day, a bright blue standard poodle surprised her mama. 
I had another client message me. She said, girl, you got a thug crying in the airport. I said, say what? She said, yeah. He started crying at the sight of those pink and blue Pomeranians running down the aisle. Another time, I had to give Sam the Terrier a dapper look. So I gave him a black and gold polka dot bow tie and the comb over of a lifetime. Brad Pitt couldn't touch it. The part, the precision, and my, I like to call it a little salt based sprinkle of love. Check out that handsome guy. <laughs> then there's a poodle, Ginger. Absolutely adore her. Her dad is this real big brawlic guy. I mean, tattoos all over. Imagine seeing that man walking down the street with a little poodle and a heart on her butt. That's what I did. Her mom wanted to surprise her dad. He saw Ginger and he said, Ginger, is that a little heart on your butt? Is that a heart on your butt? Sometimes my clients, I wonder, what were you watching that made you say, oh, Ashley can do that? But you know what? I can, I figure it out. I make dogs look beautiful. I transform them. Talk about a transformation. Whatever crazy things people ask me to do or I come up with, it's all back to the love of animals. When I have a real stressed day, I'm like, all right, get me the biggest, roughest collie that you can find so I can just hand scissor him. And I'm back in my happy place with my baby girl. I am Ashley Ann, the grooming extraordinaire. Ooh, check out my little booze over there. <laughs> Ashley Ann is truly gifted. She's definitely got me ready to test out my grooming skills on my two furry friends. Just a few more minutes to prep. I'm gonna have these little dudes ready for their close-ups. Uh, Brother Craig, if you value your hands, you're gonna keep the brushes, scissors, and whatever other tools you got to yourself. Y'all really don't trust me, huh? Oh, no. Nah. Yeah, not at all. What's the worst that could happen? to shave you right. About to have y'all looking like rock stars. Like you ready for all the little award shows. Magazine covers, late night talk shows, that Rough Riders reboot, biopics. Oh yeah. Our next piece will definitely have you hungrier than a Craig in a tunnel in a mountain in a kitchen talking about ice cream. With an obsession with this sweet treat since her parents got her an ice cream machine at age six, she's been dropping bars like agglomeration of fat globules, fully coalescing, emulsifiers and stabilizers, and microstructure sensorial and behavioral properties ever since. We'll need our lawyers to confirm for us, but we're pretty sure she's the only black woman ice cream scientist in the country. Well, let me get my chocolate flavor self to the kitchen, and in the meantime, your attention, please. Meet Dr. Maya Warren. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? My favorite flavor of ice cream is cake batter. I really like a vanilla base, usually. Vanilla ice cream. <laughs> I mean, I'm just basic when it comes to ice cream. <laughs> I love cookies and cream. I love Jamilka almond fudge or any coffee base. I think I would choose pistachio. I love... <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, I, I love all of them. Because I'm diabetic, I'm not supposed to indulge in ice cream that often, but every night I grab a spoonful and I sit with a Ritz cracker and I enjoy a spoonful of vanilla ice cream with one cracker. <laughs> Self-control, right? <laughs> You never know where ice cream will take you. It surprises me that I truly am able to do something that gives me the feeling of a chills when I talk about it. An ice cream scientist is someone who understands and or has researched everything and anything about the science of ice cream. So going from how to make ice cream, the microstructure components of ice cream, and also the sensorial part of ice cream. So the, like how, when you eat ice cream, what does it taste like? What does it feel like in the mouth, the texture components? What flavors do you want to pop when you're making the ice cream? 
So I actually consider myself, of course, a scientist, but I'm an artist in the kitchen as well, or artist in the lab. I'm gonna make something that people didn't even know they actually needed or wanted. But when they have it, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, it's so good. Ice cream is one of the most complex foods that humans eat. It is made up of three phases, solid, liquid, and a gas, which appear in the form of ice crystals, clusters of fat globules, and air cells, which are formed during the churning process. These microstructure components are what make ice cream so fascinating. Our solid, the ice crystals, come in, of course, when water freezes into ice. But you don't want them too big, because it would cause the ice cream to feel icy. But you want them there, because of course you want your ice cream to be frozen. And the gas phase comes in via air cells. The air cells in ice cream look like air bubbles in soda, except a little bit smaller. And they're all throughout the ice cream, which makes it fluffy and scoopable. The more air, the fluffier it is. The less air, the heavier it is. Finally, the liquid comes in via the serum phase that's being frozen. So it becomes this concentrated goodness of things like sugar, fat, and water that just can't freeze anymore. And we love fat and ice cream because it gives us that creamy, delicious attribute that keeps us coming back for more and more. When it comes to ice cream, I believe that people have a deep connection with it that's actually not really about the ice cream, but the ice cream was the connector. You remember the things that bring you happiness and joy. And ice cream does just that. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. There's this custard place in St. Louis called Ted Drew's. I remember it being so hot. It is so hot in St. Louis in the summers, you can cut the heat and humidity with a knife. And getting in the car with family and friends and literally sweating as we're standing in line because it's just so hot, but also smelling that dairy, that custardy, eggy dairy, and you can't wait to get your concrete. They put all the inclusions and stuff in, and they turn it upside down with a spoon in it, and it doesn't even drop. And it's a bright yellow cup with green writing. It's cold, of course, but it's also warm. It gives you this warm feeling that I still remember to this day. I remember. I remember. I remember. My father's favorite flavor is cookies and cream, so it obviously naturally became mine. My dad probably got a waffle cone. I just did whatever. I wanted to do everything that he was doing. <laughs> For me, ice cream was like a big thing in our house, you know, because I grew up poor. So, you know, my mom, she would go like once a month to this big thing of shopping and ice cream was a must for us. My grandmother, Granny, would be sitting eating Bluebell at the dining room table. To me, she always had this regal look like a queen and she wore high heels to like the day she died. And we were all just like, Granny, you, got, you can't wear a six inch heel at 90. And she was like, actually, I, I need to wear this high heel. I remember going to um, pick up ice cream with my grandpa. He was a consistent like figure you know, in my life. I remember as a little kid eating vanilla ice cream in the living room with my dad. We used to watch TV shows together. He used to love Beretta, um, Kojak. I'm dating myself now. Hawaii Five-O, the original, not the new stuff. <laughs> Talking to the television, because we were talkers, and try to come up with who did the crime. In preparation for this, I was looking for club crackers. I said, I wonder if they still make them. When they arrived yesterday, I opened a package and tasted them, and it reminded me so much of my father. And I could feel his presence in the room with me, but it's just wonderful to have those memories growing up of time spent with him. Everyone has that memory of holding their grandfather's hand and walking down the street or, you know, crossing the street to go to their favorite ice cream shop. They can almost take themselves back. Everyone's able to sort of connect to the product. And I realized that the beauty of it is that ice cream speaks every language. It knows no barriers. It has no boundaries. And no matter where you are, you can find something like ice cream that will put a smile on someone's face. And ice cream not only looks, but also tastes different depending upon where you are in the world. You can explore ice cream in a country like Taiwan, 
and you'll find delicious flavors infused with locally grown teas. And what does the dairy taste like if you're in Ireland? It's extremely grassy forward. It's all because of what the cows are eating. They're grass-fed cows. In the Philippines, there are so many mangoes and they are so sweet, you can make amazing fresh mango ice cream. And in Kenya, they have this passion fruit Fanta soda that everyone drinks. They've taken that soda and made it into a delicious sorbet. People go wild for it. It's familiar, but yet with a twist. Sometimes ice cream is celebratory or it's more portable. In Sinjuku Station, one of the busiest train stations in the world, there are people grabbing all kinds of ice cream left and right, and they are on the go. Ice cream has taken me to places emotionally that I never knew it actually could. No matter where you are in life, what city or state or country you're in, if you say ice cream, people's eyes light up. We latch onto those memories of just simply being happy. And ice cream has taken me places I could have never, ever imagined. I tell people all the time, if I can be an ice cream scientist, you can be anything mm. and everything that you want to be. Ice cream is my love language. And I hope that people can find their love language the way that I found mine. Well, let me be the first to tell my nutritionist that I fully blame Dr. Warren for my newfound obsession with the culinary analysis of frozen aerated desserts. Looks like I'll need to push that trip to Ibiza back another year. Oh well, worth it. Mm. Reminds me of, ah, oh, oh my God, oh, my beautiful black brain. It's frozen. I got that pain in my brain. Oh, 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 wow. Oh. I have it again. I have it again. Ah, I ate it too fast, but it's so good. Oh, 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 oh. Y'all know by now, Craigie has needs. And in this instance, that need is for speed. Now this mining cart is not exactly scratching that itch, but it'll get my point across as I set up this last story. When you think of who's in the pit crew, I'm pretty sure the last person you think of is a sister. Good, keep that same energy as you watch this, because when you see what she's working with, your perceptions will be blown away at the same speed as the stock cars whizzing by our next amazing subject's head every time she hits the track. Your attention please, meet. Brianna Daniels. If someone told me that I was gonna be the first black woman in the NASCAR pit crew, I would have been like, what? I don't even watch NASCAR. For real, what is that? I was sitting on campus in between classes, having a lunch break. I was about to take a bite out of my sandwich and I get like a strong tap on my shoulder and I'm like, what's up girl? My friend who worked in the athletics department at the time, she was like, you know, the NASCAR pit crew is gonna be at our school on Wednesday. I think you should try out. And then she goes to YouTube and shows me a video of a pit stop. And I was like, uh, dang, that was fast. But still like, <laughs> what are you telling me this for? Cause I don't watch no NASCAR. I've been an athlete my entire life. I was a point guard and a shooting guard on the women's basketball team at Norfolk State. I was training to play basketball overseas at the time, so my body's all beat up. And I'm like, if I go to this, will I be able to give it my all? This NASCAR tryout was held in our basketball gym, and I was so nervous. I'm looking around like, what is up with all this equipment laid out everywhere? Like, I don't see any race cars. 
And that's when I met Coach Phil Horton, my coach now of NASCAR Drive for Diversity. He's like, relax, relax. Today, I'm going to be taking you guys through a fitness test. If you do a good job today, you'll get an invite to the National Combine. Focus. You know, and actually, you're my one and only girl up in here today. Oh, I'm the only girl trying out? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, great. <laughs> this is so great. After hearing one of the guys tell me that, you know, none of the women ever make it. Don't tell me that, because whatever I do, I give it my all and I work hard. And I feel like I give it my all in this tryout. <laughs> Before I even sat down on the plane to go back home, and I got a call. They're like, Coach couldn't wait to tell you he wants to extend the invitation for you to come back in the fall. I got invited to the National NASCAR Drive for Diversity pit crew, and that's when I learned that I was going to be a tire changer. I remember us having like a lunch break, and I was like one of the only people like left over by the car, and Coach was like, Bree, you, you're not going to eat lunch? And I was like, I'll be over there in a little bit, but I got to work on this right now because I, I I don't know how to do this. So we're going to get this right first. We had a metronome that we used. So I'm sitting there listening to it like, dun, 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 dun. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Making sure I'm in sync. My impact wrench is my bread and butter. That's what paid the bills. That's the money maker. I need that to make sure that my driver doesn't have a tire rolling down pit road. It's a big deal. Being a basketball player goes hand in hand with being a, a tire changer. You have to be poised, calm. You have to have that quick hand speed and you have to have that focus. You're constantly under pressure, but you have to be able to handle that pressure well. So that's what I do. My very first race was in Nashville, Tennessee for the ARCA race. I was super nervous that day because it really didn't hit me until I got to the track. I'm not going to see much of anybody that looks like me. Knowing NASCAR for what it was, the crowd, you know, I was just hoping that things wouldn't be like too crazy. People were looking at me like, dang, like, is this girl lost? My adrenaline is just pumping. And I'm a little nervous, but it's a good nervous. Ready, boys? I'm going to be ready for everything that's going to happen on pit road. Let's do this. So I'm really not the norm in NASCAR, and that's the main reason why I joined. I've been trying to change that. I know like with the mindset I had coming into NASCAR, I knew that the journey wasn't gonna be easy, but I made it my mission to be in this position to make it easier for the next person coming up behind me. Seeing my mom battle with breast cancer for most of my childhood, it gave me the strength for everything that I'm doing now. Seeing how hard she went while she was sick, while she was in this state, I looked at her as superwoman. Even when I feel like quitting or giving up, I just have to think about her and it just gives me that extra push to keep going. Thank you, Mom. The other people who are wanting to join the sport, you know, other black women, other black boys, black girls, people that look like me, just look at me and see that I'm doing it and know that you can do it too. I just would say, you know, keep pushing, keep working hard. If that's really your dream, you have to go after it. Even though it was very tough in the beginning, there are people who 100% have my back, who are fighting for me all the way. I grew a love for NASCAR just with seeing the strides that we've been making. 
hopefully one day I will see our sport look like how the NBA looks or the NFL looks. Having multiple races and not just one race specifically dominating our sport. So y'all still think sisters can't pick crew? I didn't think so. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Can't wait to continue showing y'all around my fortress of blackness next week. I've got lots more tricks up these little sleeves, I can promise you that. In the meantime, don't forget to find what you love, share it with the world, and scream from the mountaintop. Damn. That line hits different this year with the whole mountain theme. Huh. And scream from the mountaintop, quite literally. Your attention, please.